Well, hello, oh. Life Force. Good morning. Hi, nice we started you. the interview just like that. That's right. Okay, that's fine with me. Diane Roblin, the first thing I want to ask you is uh, you were knee deep in music for half of your life, then you were away from it for a long time, and you came back with a vengeance. Right. Can you describe that, that coming back after not playing for so long? What was that like? Well, everything's been so organic, really. I haven't, uh, it hasn't been a plan. Things have just unfolded. Uh, in a very organic fashion. I, uh, yeah, I was in, in music for a while, f for a long time, and played with all kinds of different bands, and uh, Rough Trade to my own jazz band, Synergy, which was a really great band, with Bobby Bruff and Michael Stewart, all those guys back mm -hmm. in the day. And um, then I found all kinds of other creative outlets, which I really enjoyed. I went into... Um, this isn't exactly what you asked me to No, tell but you. I like this. We're oh, going to go oh, back okay. to the past anyway. So getting us into like, yeah, you, you were not playing music for a while. I wasn't playing for right. a long while. And what were you doing? Well, I had gotten into the film business, so I was doing development consulting. I actually worked at Nelvana for a while and learned some business affairs. And um, then also, I went into what I thought might have been my calling. I became a frontline crisis counselor at a teenage girl shelter for eight years. And if you asked me what I was going to be doing when I was 16, I probably would have said I've been a teenage social worker. So it's kind of interesting how everything comes around organically. It all happens. It all fits. You know, um, actually, my degree is in sociology. So that's another story for how I got into, wow. into it all, yes. Uh, but you want me to cut to going back? Well, it's just that moment. The thing I'm curious about first, because I do want to go back and start at the sure. beginning. But the idea of you being away from music for a long time, and then coming back and having so much to say. Yes. Well, it, again, it happened organically. Um, my husband passed away uh, suddenly, unexpectedly, and there was an event for him, and I decided I wanted to play at this event. And I had taken a long break from music. I had been doing a lot of cocktail work and felt that I wanted to go into other creative areas. And so I wasn't playing so much. And then when this happened, I thought, well, I want to participate in this. And I came and opened the evening, actually it was a Hughes room, and I opened the evening with a solo piece of McCoy Tyner's, which Search for Peace, which is one of my favorite, uh, my favorite tunes, and I feel very connected with that. And then I started jamming with Fathead, longtime friends of mine, Bucky. Very Peter, good band. Omar Tonic, longtime friends. And I really was having a good time. Okay, so a year or so goes on, and I run into some musicians. And they say, let's play. So I say, okay. And then they come over and um, one person, Howard Spring, uh, who I'd known for a long time, who was in my band back in, in the first time around, he said, let's play your tunes. And I said, well, okay. Because I really, the standards and everything, I'd been there and done that a lot. And I um, was really excited to go back and look into my old, old repertoire. So before I knew it, I said, let's get a bass player. Let's get a horn player. Let's get a drummer. Well, we better get a gig. So now we have a gig. Well, now, okay. Well, life is kind of nutty, and I don't have much control over certain things. But I'm going to see what goes next. So I, you know, started finding gigs, and I, I made a record reconnect five years ago. And before I knew it, I was, you know, I'm out. I'm playing. It's happening. That Reconnect album had so many great ideas, and sometimes it was indescribable. Sometimes it's probably you know, ballads and bebop and things. Were those new songs you were writing as you were going with this new band, or were those old songs from the past that you had shined up? Right. Well, the word Reconnect for that band and that name is exactly what it was. I was reconnecting with my musical self, mm -hmm. right? And um, some of the tunes were new, like uh, um, were new uh, from the, that time, and some of them were old. And I, I found a book of all my compositions from my jazz band that I was in in the 70s, which was Synergy. And there were these tunes, and I went, I wrote this? I don't remember writing this, which was very, very strange. You know, Ballad in 3-4, when did I write this? This is beautiful, I, I like it. And then um, Renewed on Thanksgiving Day is on the first uh, record also. What was Renewed on Thanksgiving Day? You know, it was a very interesting experience to find these old compositions, all, all written out in ink, you know, with my little penmanship uh, in a notebook of uh, sheet music. And then others were written um, uh, right at the time. For example, Fasten Your Seatbelt, I was in France, mm -hmm. and I was... I was spending a lot of time in Antibes, France. 
yeah. who we were. And I was playing with bands. Um, this is, I guess, in the second half after my husband had passed. So I got back into music. I was playing with bands there. And they were like funky and R&B and blues bands. And I thought, well, I want to do something that's going to allow me to stretch. So I wrote the head to fasten your seatbelt because it's really a one chord tune. And the rhythm sections who were kind of in the blues world and who I was bumping into, they could do that and I could go as far out as I wanted. Right. It's a challenging line, though. It is. It's yeah. a blast. It's yeah. totally nutty. So and people have to be good players to be able to play yes, that line. Yes, and I want, I, I want it to be unison, so that makes it really hard. Yeah. And I remember speaking to my sister-in-law, and I said, I have this new tune. And she said, well, you better fasten your seatbelt. I go, there you go. <laughs> That's the name of this tune. And Suspend Yourself, I wrote also in the second time around. And um, I don't really know how I compose, to be honest. I just sit down and start playing, mm -hmm. and, and then something develops into something. It's all, as I say, some, everything with me has been very organic. But Suspend Yourself, well, I wanted to write some, a pattern piece. I had been influenced by David Rosenblum and Terry Riley. So I decided to write a line in 7-4. So I wrote that line in 7-4. Again, a unison line and not easy. I don't know. I think it, they're fun, these unison lines. Now, back in your past, you had a lot of people that were a little bit unusual. Um, Charles Gale. Oh, yes. Well, that was, that, was, that was, again, organic, and that's how I, I really met George Kohler, who has been a wonderful influence and support to me. Um, and he's such a beautiful musician. He's so intuitive, and I love playing with him. And fearless, which you need to be for your band. Yes. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm realizing I'm kind of fearless, too, which <laughs> right. is very surprising to me. Well, I don't know. The entire band is. No, the entire band. Right. You guys soar when you play. That's you, right. You're at an event. Yeah. Well, I, my, my motto is high-energy music from the heart. That's, that's it. Motto. Wow, well, that yeah. pretty much says it. Yeah. Um, what was the other? You you did some um, uh, you did some uh, Ornette Coleman uh, kind oh, of workshops. Yes. yes. Well, just to finish the Charles Gale thing, just to say again organically, um, uh, he was playing at a race base, and George was playing with him along with Stitch Winston, Winston mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And they were doing free improv, and then Charles says, "I want." A piano player. Is there a piano player in the audience? And a friend sort of picked me up and <laughs> threw me on, out there. And of course, I'm really comfortable with free improvisation. It's something I've been doing a long time. I went goes back to the artist jazz band. I played with Gord Rayner and Robert Merkel, and I'm still playing duos with Michael Snow. We play two grand pianos all the time. And so I don't know. George and I clicked. It was so much fun. And then, um, and he was amazing, Charles. He's most unusual. And uh, anyway, so that, that George and I met each other that way, and then the rest of What was, a great way to meet I know, George Kohler. I know, and it was amazing, and then I wanted a bass player on a gig, and he happened to be available, which really surprised me, and then we did duos over at number nine. It just, again, yeah. this whole organic experience. He uh, co-produced this record with yes, you, right? Yes, yes, he's the, here I am. Da -da -da. Da -da -da. <laughs> he's, he produced it, and I was sitting by his side, yeah. Awesome. So, mm-hmm. <clears throat> Back in the 70s, I went to this Ornette Coleman Carl Berger workshop. That was amazing. Started in Woodstock, and it was Dave Holland, and we moved into Ornette Coleman's studio in Manhattan. <clears throat> and all these musicians, Lee Konitz, for example, came, and he wanted everyone to sing their solos. So, I mean, it was very challenging. Jack DeJeanette was playing my Fender Rhodes. <laughs> I mean, it was pretty exciting, and that was the era when they, they were my heroes. You know, in the 70s, I was listening to a lot of Herbie Hancock and playing along with him, as well as McCoy Tyner, really, was my first um, entree into the yeah. marvels of what the piano can do. So that was very interesting, and I met a lot of people, the Revolutionary Ensemble, Jerome Cooper, Leroy Jenkins, and um, I might have, this, this came up the other day, I might have stayed in New York. But, you know, there weren't, I, there weren't a lot of women around, and I think that I felt intimidated, too, even though I was getting such good feedback from all the musicians. Yeah. But that was fascinating, and I learned a lot. Really yeah, cool. women in jazz in the 70s, mm -hmm. you could count the famous ones on probably on one hand. Not yeah. including singers, but yeah, just Yeah, right. It was, so I wonder if I would have related it to it differently today. Mm -hmm. Now, so you came to Canada. You're originally from America, though, right? I'm from Buffalo, New York. Yeah. And I came up here to finish university at York University. I had been at Case Western Reserve in Cleveland, mm -hmm. and everyone kind of dispersed. So I came up here, and boy, I was really lucky to come up here in the 70s at York University because it was really 
a fabulous place to be. And you, did you have all different studies? Mm -hmm. Were you studying a little music at that time as well, or was it all social work and stuff? Well, you know, I got here, and um, I can see myself in the gym looking for an elective, and I had to build up my social work credits, but I had almost all of them to, I was almost finished. Yeah. I, in fact, I don't even remember any social work courses that I took up there. And I look around the room, and I'd signed up for Alan Lessons 20th Century Music. Well, that was it. That was it. I loved it. You know, Shostakovich, Paderewski, all these artists. It was a very loose time where you could, you know, it was a very free period during the 70s. Then I took David Rosenblum's electronic music. Then I could take Trishy Shankran's Murdungam, South Indian drumming, John Higgins singing. Yeah, so I, electronic, avant-garde, uh, 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 world music. You've, you've studied all of it. Yeah. And I, I actually got credit for a year of Stockhausen Stimmung. Which is, you know, learning how to, I won't demonstrate, but um, <laughs> how to use your voice to create overtones. And it's a composition. And just imagine that, I, you know, so my whole world was music. Music, music, music. It's early in the morning, so you probably aren't ready to do that. I'm not that doing it. Extra and voice. at the same time, um, you know, I already had accomplished piano skills, but I wasn't playing. Uh, I had sort of taken a break again after I played from 8 until 16, and then I took a break. Um, is it comes in and out of my life music. It just happens. And so I got here in 1970-ish, uh, and I, I started taking all these music courses, and of course now I wanted to play the piano more. And across the street from me lived Jane Vasey. Jane Vasey, the Downchild Blues Band, who was actually made of honor in my, at my wedding. We were very close friends. Yep. And she was playing, oh my gosh, she was the most incredible classical musician. So now I'm simulated up at York, and now I want to play the piano again. So I'm playing piano taking classical lessons. To make a long story short, we had, and she would say the same thing. She passed away very young, you know, 32 right. yeah. um, of leukemia. Anyway, our story together is that I handed her an Otis Spann record, which is a, a blues artist, a very well-known blues piano player, and she ended up in Downchild's Blues Band. And she'd only been a classical player up to that point. Right. No, she was really one of the strongest musicians in that band. She was incredible. She's a monster musician. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and she started giving me work as a piano player in theater and all these other things. And before I, you know, and again, organically, now I'm in the music business, you know, <laughs> and I'm loving it and I'm studying and I'm woodshedding and I'm doing everything one needs to do to progress. Let me ask you about this. Oh. Um, <laughs> an insane. Life Force is the new record. It is so heavy. There's oh. so the charts are heavy. There are moments that make you feel uh, maybe like I don't know what peyote feels like, but you know, so it makes you feel otherworldly. Some is that of these right? songs. Oh, yeah. that's cool. Tell me a little bit about some of these arrangements. I believe Bruce Cassidy did some of the arrangements. He, he's speaking of another wonderful musician and supportive person. I'm so so lucky to have uh, connected with him. Um, as well as all the musicians, I should because I don't want to forget mm -hmm. Kevin Turcotte's on trumpet, Jeff Lowershell's on tenor and bass clarinet. What a gorgeous instrument! Mm -hmm. And Ben Riley's on drums, and then there's Bruce Cassidy on EVI, and the lyrical George Kohler on bass. Um, and you on piano. And me on <laughs> piano. I play Fender Rhodes and Grand Piano yeah. on, the, on this record. Um, Bruce Cassidy took a tune of mine, "Snowy Day." That's a very Beautiful tune. I like it. It's most of these tunes are all were all written within the last six years, mm -hmm. except for the ballad in three four. So um, and he said, I love this and I'd like to have this with my big band. So do you mind if I arrange it? So he ended up putting an arrangement together for this record that is so beautiful. I was knocked off my. He, he turned it into an epic. Yep, it he turned sure it is. into an epic. Yeah. This 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 uh, snowy day, and then George and I do a reprise of a duo. We play as a duo at the end, which is very sweet. Time really flies because your first record was five years ago. I, I know. mean, not your first, but your first since you returned. Well, yeah. it was my first record, and that back in the seventies and eighties, people weren't making records. Right. You had to be a label. I mean, by the nineties, I was playing a lot of clubs and cocktail clubs and uh, parties, and and it wasn't a stimulated. I wanted to go in a different direction, so that's how I ended up. But you're right. Records were over $20,000. You had yeah. to have a label deal with that. Yeah, yeah, you weren't, you know, now everyone's got so many CDs, it's, they just do it because they want to do it, I guess. Yeah. But yes, so this, so that was my first one, and this is my second one. Tell me about the production of this. Where did you go for this? This was a Canterbury music? Well, the, um, all the band, 
tracks were recorded at Canterbury. Yeah. And um, with Jeremy Darby. Jeremy Darby loves jazz. He's great. It's he probably the... why he can still do this job because yeah. he loves the music that he's actually helping here. Well, he's one. Of, he's a very busy man. Yeah. He really. Is. Oh yeah. My my. And um, he gets a beautiful piano sound, which is most appreciated. And then the other tracks are George and I as a duo, and they were recorded six months prior at Number Nine Studios with Bernie um, Sisternus at the helm, and. Um, we had gotten together and we decided that we were just going to play for the, because we had such a good connection um, and we were going to sort of freely improvise on some of my tunes but take them out yep and um, they were wonderful and they were and again organically here I'd met George and he's so lyrical and he's so intuitive and we made music reminded me why I'm doing this. I was right. so excited after that session, really, why I do this, because it just makes you feel alive and you feel connected with who you are. And so when we went to do this record, this one, we decided we were going to add those three tracks to them. So that filled out the record, too, because I only had so many band tunes. That's great. But they're so nice. They're so wonderful. And they also give me a chance. I feel this record... Um, reconnect was reconnect, and I feel this record gives me a chance to express a lot of the different things. I because I do play a lot of free improv with um, Nick Fraser and Brody West and that whole other scene. And as I said, it goes back to the artist jazz band with um, Gord Rayner's studio, yeah. which was a real trip, and playing with Michael Snow. So that's in there as well as I love I love being in a band that's grooving and having fun and the funk and and being surrounded by all these horns playing wonderful music and they just I could just sit back and listen to them they're so fabulous I've noticed another thing in concert you really appreciate uh, your audience and you tell them that and you have people that are now kind of following you whatever club you play at they want to be at your show to see what's gonna happen next I know I have fans <laughs> you know I the whole thing it's just nutty you know and I used to at the, you asked me about when I first came back yeah well that was totally nutty like from not having played taking a long break um, to come back and have a record and be out there, I, this is totally nutty. And then my friend said to me, well, it isn't nutty anymore, Diane, because you've invested your time, your energy, your woodshedding, your writing, so, you know. Right, the you, music and the playing is this, that good. Yeah, you, you've made it happen at this point. Yeah. I really appreciate the audience, and I do have some fans at the last club at La Rev. People came because they heard me before, and I didn't know anybody, and you were there, and I didn't know anybody didn't there. You didn't know the audience, right. Too, and they stayed the whole night. Yeah. And it, it's um, it's amazing. I think it's great. I think it's easy for people to pay attention because your music is very unboring. <laughs> I don't oh, think good. I think it's very easy for people to pay attention. I think it's joyous. <laughs> That's I right. I think my music is joyous. Tell me about your show November fifth. Okay, boy, time flies. Did we already get to November fifth? <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, I'm excited. It's a huge room. November fifth. Tuesday night, 8 o'clock, I have the whole band from the, the CD. Um, it's going to rock. It's going to be fabulous. It's going to be a night of joy and friendship. Uh, people are going to come you know, out of the woodworks I haven't seen in a while, and they're happy to see each other. I really do, I really, really do appreciate people who come out to hear me. And I you know, write them a thank you note because I really do appreciate it. Right. I really do. And, um, and we're going to do uh, all the tunes off the record. We have to do fine and funky and fasten your seatbelt. Thank you, my two favorites. Exactly, I, I think so. And um, and George and I are going to do a, a duo tune in each set because that's on the record. But also, it's a it's part of who I am. I've always done something solo, and George and I are going to do some duo to work also. Beautiful. Well, you certainly have a life force. That's a great name for your record. Well, you know that plant, that that uh, cover. I have a plant in my bay window that reaches a 10-foot ceiling that I've had for over 30 years. And it is a life force to me. I absolutely love it. And uh, I was very excited because I couldn't figure out how to put it on the cover, and I thought of Olga Navotvova. I'm not pronouncing her name right, but she's a virtual reality artist. Yeah. And I don't know if you've done this, but if you take Artie Vive app on your phone mm -hmm. and you aim it at the cover, it comes alive. It turns into a video. Oh, that's amazing. I know. I'm a modern woman. <laughs> Good luck at your oh, show, and thank, thank you, you so for making much. important music. Oh, I'm, so, I'm so flattered that you would be interested in taking the time with me. Oh, you're the best. Thank you so much.